Good morning. So good to see old faces, familiar faces, and new familiar faces. Uh, I think this year is going to be wonderful. Amen. So let's stand. Let's go ahead and begin our worship this morning. Because God is so good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. I need y'all to come and sing. You want to praise me?
as we continue this series, as, as I said, we talk about two today that um, don't have a part in the nativity story at all. They are uh, two that are not even talked about very much at all. They, they don't get a playbill on anything. Um, if they were credits to a movie, they would be those very last ones that people are walking out of the theater as it's rolling by. There's just no, no dedication to them at all. In fact, the cattle and the sheep and the, the donkey get more notoriety than these two do. But I want to I wanna focus on them because there's some important things to learn from these two people today. Um, last night, I thought I hit the pastoral pot of gold because last night I dreamed and I preached my sermon all night long. That was like the pastoral pot of gold because it just oozed perfection, y'all. I mean, it just oozed perfection. Last night, I also had a pastor's worst nightmare because I preached my sermon all night long. And you're never going to preach it to that perfection. So... This morning I woke up and I was like, oh great, what am I going to preach now? Uh, but we're going to look at these two people because today you're invited to the strangest baby dedication that ever happened. Literally the strangest baby dedication. Um, it's, it's this baby who's picked up by a senior citizen and lifted up, given this blessing, and then looks at the mother who it says marvels at what he says, but looks at the mother and says, okay, people will love him and people will hate him. That's not the strangest baby dedication ever. Wouldn't you just say, uh, can I have my baby back, please? But that's not what this mother does. Simeon's a man who had been waiting in the temple. It says waiting for someone to show up. As a young boy, Simeon had to hear about this Messiah that was to come, this messianic promise. He had to have heard about that, and so he's waiting for it. And as he's waiting for it and waiting, you just think about how patient he had to be. And then as this baby comes in and he knows exactly who it is, that everyone else it was just oblivious to it. The Roman officials, the, the Jews were even oblivious to this baby being born. Herod himself was just too uh, arrogant to even realize what was happening. But this man had so much insight and such a relationship with God that he knew someone great had just walked in. So let's hear from Luke 2. The time came for Mary and Joseph to do what the law of Moses taught about being made pure. They took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It is written in the law of the Lord, give every firstborn male to the Lord. Mary and Joseph also went to offer a sacrifice. As the law of the Lord says, you must sacrifice two doves or two young pigeons. A man named Simeon lived in Jerusalem. He was a good man and very religious. He was waiting for the time when God would help Israel. The Holy Spirit was with him. The Holy Spirit told Simeon that he would not die before he saw the Christ promised by the Lord. The Spirit led Simeon to the temple. Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple to do what the law said they must do. Then Simeon took the baby in his arms and thanked God. Now, Lord, you can let me, your servant, die in peace, as, he, as you said. I have seen your salvation with my own eyes. You prepare him before all people. He is a light for the non-Jewish people to see. He will bring honor to your people, the Israelites. Jesus' father and mother were amazed at what Simeon had said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, Many in Israel will fall and many will rise because of this child. He will be a sign from God that many people will not accept. The things they think in secret will be made known. And the things that will happen will make your heart sad too. You can roll back just a little bit because we're going to talk about Simeon for just a minute before we talk about Mary. But let's pray. Gracious and holy God, as we continue to dive into this scripture, may our eyes and our hearts and our ears be open to hear from you today, God. So hide me behind the cross and let your message pour forth. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So Simeon lived for one thing, to see the promised Messiah. He wanted to see this, this Messiah that he's heard about. Verse 26 talks about um, that he would not die. God had told him he would not die until he saw the Christ. And so he waits and he waits and he waits for this promise that will come to take away Israel's sorrow. And he doesn't wait anxiously. He waits faithfully. And so as he continues to wait, he's devout. Now, it believes that Simeon is an older man because 
two things, first of all. It talks about death. It says he won't die until he sees this Christ, and then he's basically ready to die when he sees the Christ child. And so they believe he's an older man um, that has a pretty good knowledge of Jewish scripture and Jewish law, and so we call him today a senior citizen. This man that's about to discover the one he's waited for his entire life. And so while we don't know a physical description of him, they give a really, really good spiritual description. And so it says he's just or righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And so as he waits for the consolation of Israel, it says the Spirit was upon him. Now three times it mentions the Spirit in conjunction with Simeon. And so go back. I want to look back one, one of three places. It says the Holy Spirit was in him, number one. The Holy Spirit told Simeon that he would not die. And then it says the Spirit led Simeon to the temple. So we know that Simeon is a very spiritual man. He has this inner connection with God. And the Spirit rests heavy upon him. I think it doesn't give us a physical uh, description for two reasons. First, I think that's not important. Second, I think what is more important is that we know what his inward being is like. Samuel the prophet says that man not look at our outward appearance, but God looks at our what? Our heart. And so I really believe that's why there's no description of what Simeon was. It just leads us to believe he's older. But what it does tell us is about his inward heart. And so we know that he is a good, good man. So can you imagine Simeon? Every day in the temple, waiting, waiting for what he knows is this baby to come. Now, that wasn't an unusual thing. Every firstborn male had to go to the temple to be dedicated to God. And so every day he waits, and a baby would come in. And you have to think, you would think, I wonder if that's it. I wonder if that's it. No, no, that's not it. Over day after day after day, until finally this poor young teenage couple walks in with this beautiful precious baby and in his heart God says there he is there he is and he goes to this child that does not tell us how he gets his hands on this baby you wouldn't see that these days would you some old man comes running and she says give me your baby you're like oh please right no this this happens he walks over he gets the child whatever he says to him, he gets the child he knows who's in he knows who he has wrapped in his arms. And he thanks God for it. He says, now, God, as you said, your servant can die. I have seen your salvation. He holds this child in his hand, looks at this face, and calls it God's salvation. Now, let me tell you what that tells us right there. Salvation is not something you do. It's someone you know. You hear that? Salvation is not something you do. Jesus did not say, my ways, my teaching, my example, that's how to get there. And he said, I am the way. I am the way. Follow me. Not follow my example. When you have a relationship with Jesus, all of that falls in line. When you have a relationship one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ, then you follow his ways. You follow his teachings. You follow his examples. But he is the way. So Simeon holds this baby right here. And says, I see God's salvation. And so he goes on and he says that this man, this, this baby will, will save the non-Jews too. The Gentiles, another translation says, that means all people. All people, not just Jews, not just Mary and Joseph standing there. All people. This baby will save all people. Kind of makes you think of John 3.16, doesn't it? For God so loved the world. That he gave his son. Not just so God loved the people in the temple. So obviously Mary and Joseph are speechless. And they marvel at what this man says. But then I want you to look back at verse 33. He gives this little premonition. The first time that we hear about the cross. So we jump from the crib straight to the cross right here. He says Jesus' father and mother were amazed at what Simeon had said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary. Many in Israel will fall, and many will rise because of this child. The transliteration says, many will love him, many will hate him. He will be a sign from God that many people will not accept. The things they think in secret will be made known, and the things that will happen will make your heart sad too. You've probably heard it, the NIV version says, and a sword will pierce your soul as well. 
It's our first hint of the cross to come. So that's where Simeon is. Luke also reminds us of a woman. This woman that was in the temple named Anna. Anna, a prophetess, was there at the temple. She was from the family of Penuel in the tribe of Asher. Anna was very old. She had once been married for seven years. Then her husband died and she lived alone. She was now 84 years old. Anna never left the temple. She worshipped God by going without food and praying day and night. She was standing there at that time, thanking God. She talked about Jesus to all who were waiting for God to free Jerusalem. Joseph and Mary finished doing everything that the law of the Lord commanded. Then they went home to Nazareth, their own town in Galilee. So I want you to think about Anna here. Anna has been in the temple all of these years. Now she was a widow after seven years. If you know anything about the culture in that time, women did not own property. They didn't work. They didn't have jobs. And the jobs they could take were not enough to support them. They weren't good jobs. So if they didn't have family, basically they were homeless. They had no one else. And so it says this woman stayed in the temple 84 years. Y'all, some people won't come to church for an hour, right? 84 years. She stayed in the temple and says she prayed day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night, forever. And it says she worshipped God. She was there waiting. That means she expected. She knew. She knew something was to come. I think the story dwells not any other place in the Old Testament could I find it talking about someone's, someone's age and how long they've done something or been somewhere. Not many examples that it tells us how old someone was when they died. But it doesn't talk about someone living in what their age was necessarily. I think this story dwells on how long she was there and how old she was to let us know how long she was faithful. To let us know how long she was expecting and looking for the Holy One. And that when she was there, the reader now realizes, as we read the scripture, we now realize not just that the Holy One was there, but that she held it in her hands. And she recognized it. She recognized it. The reason they saw Jesus is because they were looking for him. They saw Jesus because they were expecting him to show up. A lot of times people will go to church and walk out. And I, I can't tell y'all really, honestly, how many times I'll get messages online. Some just kind of split. Some will say, what a great service. It was right for me. And then every now and then I'll get some that will go, well, I didn't need anything out of that today. Okay, that's not my problem. You weren't expecting God to show up. It's not me. It's God. And if you don't expect God to show up and you don't expect to have an encounter with him, that's your problem, right? They saw God. But see, here's the thing. While they were in wait for all of those years, they didn't just sit there and twiddle their thumbs. They did something. They prayed. They worshipped. They fasted. They, they meditated. They served. They were there with the people to pray over those new babies. They did something. So I want to tell you that during the time of COVID and quarantine, the church remained faithful. And this church continue to serve. We stepped out in ministry in ways that we were so uncomfortable with. So uncomfortable with. But God called us to it. And this church, not me, this church was faithful to do what God called us to do. If you weren't out delivering meals, if you weren't out buying gifts for kids, if you weren't visiting folks on their doorstep with gloves and masks and shields, you were praying for the people that were. This church remained faithful. This season, this Advent season, we had for the past two years, someone step up, as y'all know, and said that they would offer a challenge. That if we would take up a second giving through Advent of up to $10,000, they would match it. They wanted to start the year off ahead, not just bare minimum, but ahead for ministry. The first two years, we matched it. We hit it. And it was matched. And so we started the year out with about $20,000 ahead just for ministry. And so this year, after a rough year for everyone, um, nobody expected that. But another donator stepped up and said, we want to do this. We don't want to let this go by the wayside. And if 1000 comes in or 10000 comes in, we'll match it. Up to $10,000, we'll do it. And so every Sunday, we've taken up a second offering. 
We then had someone that, that said, you know, the online folks want to get in on this too. And so if we hit up to $5,000 in a second giving online, we'll match up to $5,000 there. And so people have given and it has rolled in. And so I said that I would give totals today. Um, I said we would cut it off the last day of the of the month. But I just want y'all to know God knows no time and God's in control. And he laughs at me when I try to be. And so it didn't end on the 31st. We've actually had something else coming today. Um, so I want y'all to kind of know the totals. So in our regular giving, the regular second giving in person, checks mailed in, those kind of things. We had given $13,595. In our online giving, we had given $2,839.30. Now that's $16,434 if you're a mathematician. I had to do it on the calculator. Now the $13,595, you'll need to know, is before the $10,000. So actually, $23,000. $595 in the regular giving. $28,39.30 in the online giving, which will be matched. That put us at $29,273.60. And so yesterday I was like, good Lord, God is good. God is so good. Almost $30,000. And then I had a phone call that said I want to give $750. So that threw us over the $30,000 to $30,023.60. As if that wasn't enough, we now, now have another $2,160 coming into the online, which puts us at $32,184.60 to start the year in ministry. Y'all missed a huge chance to say glory be to God. That was huge. Y'all just need to know that. But as if God didn't do enough because he rewards faithfulness, we also, as of last week, were granted from the conference because of our work during COVID and because of work that might have to continue on into the year, we were granted $25,000 from the conference. So in case you need to know a total, that is $57,184.30 to start the year in ministry. Come on, y'all.
Holy and gracious God, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is poured upon this place, on the elements that we hold in our hands, that we eat, that we drink, that they are for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, broken and shed for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the whole world, gracious God. Jesus came for the whole world. May we never, never take our eyes off the cross. May we remember the crib, but may we never forget the resurrection, because that is where our hope lies, is in the resurrection. And so we thank you for this name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. We thank you for this gracious God and for all of your many blessings, day after day after day. May we be strengthened and renewed as we partake of this meal. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is our hope and our assurance. Let's stand. Let's join together in our closing hymn.